Yes, so this evening we have uh, Dr. Camilla Power um, from here in UCL. Um, Camilla is uh, in some ways unusual in that she's a biological anthropologist uh, trained here under Leslie Ayello, um, but she's equally a social and cultural anthropologist who's done field work among the Hadza uh, bow and arrow hunter gatherers in Tanzania. And so her focus really is, has always been one way or another, has always been Africa. Um, and that's partly because, of course, um, it's in Africa that we became humans. So there are some theories which say that we kind of evolved in Africa biologically, but we didn't get smart with language and art and stuff until we, until our ancestors hit Europe in the upper Paleolithic revolution. But partly because of who's coming in the door now, um, probably the world's number one specialist in the OCA record of human evolution um, is as Ian Watts. We now know that actually, um, in Africa, Africa is the place where everything really started. So you might even say language was invented by African hunter-gatherers, as was religion, as was kinship, as was art. Um, and uh, there was particular ways in which um, the culture was established. And in our view, there's, there's really no question, culture was established in resistance against um, primate-style dominance. So among monkeys and apes, you usually get a hierarchical system, you get an alpha male or a few males dominating the females. And we believe, and we're not the only ones, that we became human through the kind of process of resistance against alpha male dominance, um, but, but even an overturn of male dominance culminating in what anthropologists often term reverse dominance. But so that means the revolution was initiated, the human revolution was initiated primarily by, by women. Um, and what we argue is that, that and if you want to understand what's been happening over the world over the last 40,000, 70,000, 100,000 years, it's useful if you know how everything began, because how things begin sets constraints about the range of variation of, of things you know, subsequently. And, and we kind of say that even today, all the different versions there are of ritual and religion and cosmology and mythology, in many ways, they're variations on a theme and the ultimate logic of all these different ways there are of organizing a sacred kinship, ritual, mythology, and so on, um, they are kind of almost echoes, really, of the way we started, including what Camilla is going to be talking about now, which is women's resistance in Africa in more recent times. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I, I'm hardly going to be talking about hunter-gatherers today, which is unusual for me these days. Um, I'm, I'm really going to be talking about uh, women of, of different African communities um, and um, it, across the African continent we find cases of women deploying very powerful collective tactics um, to resist male harassment, oppression and injustice. Their targets range from sex offenders to colonial administrators, oil corporations and corrupt warlords. And one of the most powerful techniques is also perhaps the most ancient or archaic. It is the threat of what's called undress, stripping naked and exposure of genitals as, as really an, an extraordinary power. And um, before I go further, I just wanted to acknowledge the sources of, of African scholars, particularly who've been researching the idea of, uh, of undress um, in recent years and, and recent decades, um, in fact, the person that I really wanted to be here talking tonight was Professor Breitelotzi, um, who's been, who, it is his terminology, actually, the idea of undress. Um, and I had invited him, but he is over on the West Coast in America, in US, and um, teaching on his Tuesday morning, our Tuesday evening, so it made it almost impossible. I also wanted to name check um, Helen and Day. Um, I don't think Helen is here yet, but I hope she's joining me. She's on a very busy workday break and she's going to join us in just a while. And I hope I'll be able to cut her in. Helen gave us a beautiful talk um, back in summer, which is, oh, oh, yeah, I can't say it's on our Vimeo because we've, we've um, got some uh, we had some problems with that recording, unfortunately, but we have got recordings of Helen's talk on African riddles, and Helen's got a, 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 an amazing breadth of knowledge um, on African ritual and, and uh, mythological systems. 
And she has also been pointing me to some of the most interesting recent material on women's political resistance in Cameroon, which is um, where Helen comes from. I'll also be referring to work by the Igbo anthropologist Ifya Madume um, with this wonderful book. I mean, for anybody who hasn't um, kind of got any uh, familiarity with Africanist and uh, African and African anthropologists, um, this is a great starting point, male daughters, female husbands on the gender and ritual systems of um, Igbo uh, culture, particularly Igbo, Igbo women. Um, and, we, and of course, we'll be talking about the Igbo women's war um, in, in just a while. Um, so to, to start off, um, one of the things for sure about these extraordinary um, flexible types of strategies of, of women of many different communities and many different ethno-linguistic groups from all over Africa who can be um, seen to be involved in, in these tactics. So these actions are not um, small scale. They go right across landscapes through extraordinary, um, a kind of woven tapestry of women's links um, links to women in the villages where they've been married, links back to their kin, village, um, ritual societies, title societies, market societies. They're just a kind of interwoven network by which women can send news, send messages, send information across landscapes. Um, and these are clearly, these are clearly very ancient. They're very old. They're way back, although these tactics um, became provoked a lot of the time and, and were part of the resistance to colonial administrators. Uh, it, it wasn't just in colonial times. It clearly is proceeding and going back into a history before the historic written record, um, but maybe referred to through African oral history. Um, and what's extraordinary is that these tactics are coming out of a um, really very rural, very conservative, traditions in many ways, you know, women's um, village ritual communities. And yet they had this capacity for flexible, um, versatile expansion in very contemporary political modes, as I hope you're going to see. Um, these are strategies that almost surely exist. This collective um, uh, exposure as a tactic almost surely exists on every continent. Um, but the oldest, I'm sure, is belongs to the African continent and in some ways the most deeply meaningful, culturally meaningful use of these tactics, I would claim, um, is African. Now I want to start sharing screen so the Zoom can record off here. And I'm going to, thanks, thanks for that. Um, and I'm going to um, perversely perhaps start with showing some of the naked protests that's been doing performances from women of European heritage, or in this case, it's a Latin American, but perhaps European heritage also, um, performing naked protest. And some of these have been very brave and extraordinary performances. And this is a case of Nuna Menos um, with uh, a protest against gender-based violence. So you can see feminicidio, genocidio, is femi femicide as genocide. Um, and yeah, this that link down below uh, that I kept there hopefully goes to a film that has been expunged from the internet. So that so says something about the sort of nakedness that the internet is prepared to tolerate. Um, so yeah, and this is another example. This is the one that we need to have the very dark room and you can raise the lights a bit after that. Um, this comes from International Women's Day, uh, but just before the COVID lockdown of 2020. And it's on Waterloo Bridge with XR women doing a, top, a spearhead performance of topless protest using their torsos to write slogans on um, climate and the rape of planet Earth. So as a, a kind of identity of women's bodies to the body of the planet and the, the notion of violence committed. So this is a really brave, um, you know, work to try to raise a cosmology, if you like, that, that is 
changing perceptions of what women's nakedness and bodies can do in public space. And now I'm going to show you what, a, what the experts do with naked protest. And this is how to do naked protest. You notice they haven't taken their clothes off. And that's because when it really is working, you just threaten to take your clothes off and that does the job. Um, maybe I just have a little more light. Um, so, thanks so much, because I um, need to have a bit of, of reading. So this is a very famous, very famous historic occasion. The invasion, the occupation by some 600 unarmed women, unarmed, they're armed with um, not mere weapons, um, unarmed women of different communities, it, not just it's Kihili and Nijor, women of the Niger Delta, invading Escrovos, the Chevron Texaco oil terminal, occupying, they nipped onto a staff ferry, um, got into the terminal, um, totally occupied it, trapped the workers into the uh, terminal. And um, several, for 10 days, there was this big standoff um, negotiating with Chevron Texaco. What were the women um, you know, were, uh, objecting to? was the um, hideous degree of, um, of um, pollution that had been destroying their resources, their fishing creeks, their crayfish beds, um, their oil spills and gas flares, destroying their health, their water sources, their children's health. Um, the fact that, that the oil companies had not kept their promises on infrastructure producing you know, supporting schools and hospitals and clinics and so forth in the area. So they had a huge amount to object to. And when the women piled into that terminal and they saw the sort of wealth and they, they, they were saying, well, this is just America, you know, what is this place compared to the impoverishment of the, of the Delta communities outside? Um, and they took the, they cut the terminal off completely. They took over the helicopter pads, the airstrip. You can see here the dock with all the women lined up where they just they've just kind of got got off the the ferry um now i'm going to read some from um bright alotzi on this because he's been documenting this um this recent um uh, nigerian contemporary use of uh undress why don't they need to actually undress although i think they they had to actually go to the state of undress at certain points to really persuade the CEOs of, Texo, of, of Chevron Texaco to take notice. But Alotsi says, in Nigerian context, exposure by older women. So these women range from about 30, it's said to about 90 years old. Exposure by older women, in particular kin relationships is powerfully taboo and results in male security staff abandoning their posts, making it highly effective. The unclothed female bodies are powerful site of protest, argues Alotsi. Nigerian women, he says, have resurrected traditional forms of socio-political protests and resistance. When you see our mothers go naked again, remember they represent power, subversion, and resistance. Um, so in this, uh, in this um, recent resurgence, and there's been plenty of other instances that, that Alotsi's documented in, in Nigeria in, the, in recent years. Um, when this resurgence of undressing, such as this July 2002 event, um, her, the signals are perfectly, were perfectly understood by the Nigerian managers and staff um, uh, and resulted in operational shutdown, which means her production of 500,000 barrels of oil a day was just brought to a stop for 10 days. So this got the notice of the CEO, uh, CEOs of Texaco, Texaco, Texaco Chevron. Um, they tried to say at the beginning, oh, the women's uh, grievances are unjustified, but they soon realized those women weren't going anywhere. Um, by the time more, you know, more than a thousand of women were involved by taking additional flow stations from around the the, the actual terminal, um, their essential message by being prepared to go to nakedness was, we don't mind to be killed. Okay. Um, I'm going to just read a little more from Alotsi's account. I'm sorry, I've got it on my mobile here. Um, so this is um, Alotsi's 
yeah, just let's just go a little further here. Um, when the youth and so youth and younger people, elders had tried um, demonstrations against Texaco Chevron and the Niger and the Nigerian government, which in the era of 2002, the women realized was completely useless and going to be doing nothing to protect their interests. And therefore they that were going to be doing direct action and they took up the cause. Um, their use of the undress tactics placed fear among the Texaco Chevron workers. Their cause garnered attention and responses nationally and then internationally. Um, so you know, uh, the women made it clear they were not afraid to die in the course of their action. They had prepared the action for a long time ahead and they were ready to stay there on the terminal for several weeks. Uh, it wasn't something that was going to stop overnight. The company therefore, you know, they had to jump to it. They had to comply to women's demands for support for infrastructure, for employing the women's own sons, the local people in the, the oil terminal, um, and for um, clearing up the horrible pollution. Um, and the way that uh, uh, Elotzi expresses this is he said, the, the women showed how lethal, I love this use of the word, lethal, the force of their nakedness was, and the extent to which they were willing to go in using their body as sites of power, collective struggle, and negotiation. Okay. <laughs> the idea of lethal nakedness is something that, yeah, I think we need to find out about. Um, so let's just, and this is an extraordinary testament from an older woman, an older Igbo woman. You can see that. Let me move that out the way. Can I not go, why can I not get that to the right? I don't know why it doesn't bring me up, but anyway, let me just take that out of the way for now. Somebody well, there. It should be me. Know, I don't know why it doesn't. Yeah, anyway, let's, you can pretty much read it and I'll, I'll just um, say it. So this is uh, Alotzi's interview with an older Igbo woman who was um, present in the protest. And this is indicating to us that there is a really you know, powerful cosmological dimension involved in these actions. Um, we, the women, I mean old mothers, can do and undo a person when we strip naked before Allah. Now, Allah is an Igbo, a, a female earth deity. Allah conceived us and empowered women to conceive. First, we bear our nakedness, telling Allah, here we come. And next, we raise our eyes and hands heavenwards to chi, chi, a spiritual, a personal divine spiritual force, telling chi to fight for us. Whenever we are naked before Allah and chi, know that the matter has gone beyond us. We are now only being used by the gods to fight the battle, and we always <laughs> succeed. Um, the, other, the other thing that uh, uh, Priscilla Nwankudu said was that very clearly, um, nakedness is not considered a shame to the woman who's naked, but to the person towards which she bore her nakedness to. This should be absolutely clear. So those Nigerian workers deserting the oil terminal, getting out of there, getting away because the whole shame, the whole curse was being turned onto them and it was, they couldn't stay there. Right. So what I, what I hope I've, I've got across already with that you know, dramatic example is that we're dealing with a cosmology. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen for now because I'm gonna to move to, we're dealing with a cosmology. Um, and what I'm trying to find out here is how does this threat of nakedness and this exposure have so much force? Um, when we're seeing uh, women uh, coming, you know, in with that sort of gathering and that sort of you know, um, um, power and dynamism, we're thinking in terms that we're seeing bodies in motion. Um, and I'm thinking of the work of Mona Finnegan talking about the um, Bayaka women as they come into camps and you know, taunting the men and getting the men to avert their gaze. Um, so it's a power of bodies in motion. It's a power invoking taboo forces and the ancestors 
chi, ala, and chi in the Igbo cosmology. It's a power that's coming out of a sort of paradoxical invulnerability from vulnerability. We're talking about elderly women, 70s, 80s, 90s, mothers, grandmothers, great grandmothers. And their, and their vulnerability is, is some kind of invulnerability. Um, and we're talking about a rejection, women's actions going right beyond sort of moral bounds is a complete rejection of, of any moral authority of the, of the target of their, their activity. Um, so that the next uh, that I want to um, go to are cases from the Cameroon. And I hope at some stage, Helen is gonna be able to join us and I can talk to her. Um, but I'm going to go back to Cameroon because some of the very first readings when I was doing anthropology here at UCL over 30 years ago now, 30 years ago or so, um, one of the first readings that I got hold of in a, in a, a course on West Africa was the extraordinary work of Shirley Ardner, um, a, uh, a, an article I recommend everybody to read, um, Sexual Insult and female militancy. And I just read this and it was so uh, mind blowing. Shirley Ardner, an English um, a background anthropologist, still Shirley Ardner still going strong and uh, working in Oxford. Um, but she was writing in the early seventies from her experiences in Cameroon and her knowledge of, of the, and she documented history of women's movements in Cameroon and also in uh, British native uh, courts in Cameroon. She was documenting all of this. And what she found during the late colonial period in Cameroon, um, a number of different ethnic groups, uh, particularly the Bakweri, uh, Balong, and the Kom, had a very similar forms of offence, a kind of any, uh, an offence which could be categorised as to the lower half of women. So it's a kind of sexual insult, an insult of women's sex as such. Um, and when that offence was made, women would have techniques of a completely collective resistance. So it was like the offence to one is the offence to all. In injury to one, the injury to all. Just the, uh, that's the usual slogan for kind of socialists and trade unionists. But this was in the case of these rural African women, Cameroon women. Um, so if to, these taboo machine domains were infringed, the women would move into action. Um, the um, types of offence were called uh, names like Titi Ikoli for uh, the Bakweri, Ndom, the Balong, um, and then the name that applied to the Kom women, Anlu, was really a technique of resistance, and we'll describe this. Um, but the meanings of Titi Akoli, okay, I'll just, um, this is a, a song from uh, one of these Bakweri women in women's uh, resistance uh, actions. Titi Akoli asenje veoli, molonga na malonga. Titi Akoli is not a thing for insults. Beautiful, beautiful. So what is that? What is Titi Akoli? It, it refers to women's genitals um, and to women's ritual secrets and to a kind of supreme value, something so valuable that it's sacred, it's, it's so valuable. Um, so there's these overlapping meanings in, in there. And then the technique that would be used if there was an, uh, an offense against that category as a, that lower half of women. So a woman who's subject to that kind of insult immediately calls out all the women of the village and they would converge in a great hullabaloo, singing obscene chants, dancing covered in vegetation from the bush. Um, and they would converge on the offender's home. Recompense, the, the offender would have to pay you know, something to satisfy not just the woman who was offended, all the women. So it would be something very costly. It would be like a pig or other desirable goods that could satisfy, it could be divided up against, amongst everybody and could satisfy the whole group of women. 
Now, with the advent of native courts under the colonial British administration, this was late in the stage of, of the, the colonial administration in, in the British part of Cameroon. Um, Bakweri cases of this category of titi akoli, the insult to lower half of women, it resulted in extraordinary high damages. So the damages that would be paid in courts would be twice or four times what was awarded in, say, divorce cases or adultery cases, effectively. Yeah, that, is what, that is how much it was being um, rated. Um, but of course, the more that women were in a, in, you know, made into plaintiffs in the native courts, the less they had the generation of, of direct action and collectivity. So of course, this played somewhat against their, their interests, perhaps. Now, among the Com women in Cameroon, um, the Anlu was a special specific technique. So the name was not so much to the category of offense as to the technique for resistance. Um, and we, it's, it's uh, worth hearing exactly what is this <coughs> technique. And this is a description from a Com man who, was, who knew about it on the ground. Anlu is started off by a woman who doubles up in an awful position and gives out a high pitch shrill, breaking it by beating on the lips with four fingers. Any woman recognizing the sound does the same, leaves whatever she's doing and runs in the direction of the first sound. The crowd quickly swells and soon there's a wild dance to the tune of impromptu stanzas, informing the people of what offense has been committed spelling it out in such a manner as to raise the emotions and cause action. The history of the offenders brought out in telling gossip. Appeal is made to the dead ancestors of the offender to join in with the Anlu so he doesn't have anyone to turn to. They're calling his ancestors to come and join. Then the team leaves for the bush to return at the appointed time, usually before dawn. Donned in vines, bits, of men's clothing. That's really interesting because interesting things happen to gender in, in these performances. With painted faces to carry out the full ritual. All wear and carry a garden egg type of fruit, which is supposed to cause drying up in any person who gets hit with it. The women pour into the compound of the offender, singing and dancing, and it's early in the morning. There's plenty enough excreta and urine to turn the compound and houses into a public latrine. No person looks human in that wild crowd, nor do their actions suggest sane thinking. Vulgar parts of the body are exhibited as the chant rises in weird depths. Just to say, Helen is around. Oh, fantastic. Oh, perfect, perfect. Oh, right, last time, Nick. I was going to um, cue her. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, hi, Helen. Fantastic to see you. I hope you're having a good day. I am. I am. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Just a little bit. Oh, it's perfect. We're all late, so so I can. You just arrive exactly on time. I was just talking about the the com. Um, well, okay. Helen, can we see you because? Or is it? Uh, no, don't worry, don't worry. You're fine, you're fine. Not don't, the best don't, time. No, no, okay, don't worry about that. Um, I'm so sorry. No, it's good to just hear. We're just good to hear. So I'm just going to talk about the, um, go into the Takumbang stuff, but I wonder if you want to actually say something first. Um, I'm just going to say something about common, the Anlu and how it was expanded. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you come in and say something on Takumbang. That would be fantastic. Um, so, at the time when Ardner was recounting this material, it appeared to be really historic. I mean, the, she's talking about the history of the native courts um, and because of the native courts and so forth, um, it seemed that only the older generation of women could recall anything but local examples of ritual boycotts and ostracism performed by women in this way. So what was extraordinary was in 1958 and ongoing through the, almost the whole of the period of the remaining um, uh, colonialism in Cameroon um, and was an Anlu uprising that involved thousands of com women 
going from 1958 in the next couple of years. And this was not targeting particular sexually abusive individuals, but it was targeting the colonial administration itself for interference, very unwise interference in women's agricultural practice. And what happened was they were raising the struggle against the, the, um, you know, the, the agricultural regulations, but effectively it was raising the struggle of um, anti-colonialism. I think that's a reasonable assessment, is that Helen, um, to say that. Um, yes, it is. Good. <laughs> um, so the other aspect of Cameroon um, material that I was going to talk about and which Helen can really help with is that um, there has been quite recently in the last few decades, we're talking now about the 1990s, um, a return of women's ritualized protest activity in a movement known as Takumbe in the Northwest province, um, the Bamenda grass fields. Um, and I've got um, some ethnography to discuss it, but I wonder if Helen would like to introduce this because you were the one who really got me onto this. Would you like to say something? Oh, absolutely. And um, I will defer to the ethnographic information you have because it's probably not as detailed as I have just talking off the top of my head. But um, Takumbeng is one of the, uh, I would call it a movement, but it's also a, a society of women usually older, and I apologize for the background noise. I'm sitting outside my place of work and this is the best I can do right now, my apologies. But it's, it's a movement of usually older women who wield a significant amount of power, or I should say wield it because over time that, that power has lessened. Um, but it has its roots in women's societies, which mainly function to protect the interests of women in the community. And together with other powerful men's uh, sacred societies, which held ritual power in the communities, their function really was to check the power of the fawn and other people in authority, usually the men, um, especially where women's interests were, were concerned. So, but there are there are, are other times when Takumben will show up um, for community interests as they did in the 90s. And what happened in the 90s was Cameroon was transitioning um, from a one party system to a multi-party system. And for the first time in a very long time, there was a, an effective opposition movement, um, which was mainly seated in the Northwest region, which is where the Takumbe um, um, societies are usually found. Mm -hmm. So um, there was, of course, interest by the authorities to, to suppress the power of this movement. And so soldiers were sent um, to the Northwest region to interfere. And if not for these women, you know, basically going into the ritual dress, dressing in men's clothes with the vines and everything, um, that the, the power of the opposition movement would have been weakened um, severely. But because they staged this protest and at the time um, it, it was just something that people had not seen happen in a long time. It was quite effective in pushing back against the, the government um, in interference in the opposition uh, germinating in this part of the country. So um, I'm going to stop there because I'm sure Camille, Camille has prepared some great material, but yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, yeah, that's confirming a lot about uh, what, what the ethnography is giving me. And I, I know that you're telling me about really rich African literary sources that uh, have, have described and, and been, you know, inspired by some of these, these um, movements. So um, I'm, I'm using you know, Global North scholars here, but um, I think there are many, many very rich African sources on this. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about the descriptions from um, uh, people like Suzanne Diduk and Fon Chingong and Tanga, who um, did uh, quite a lot of work early 2000s on these um, 1990s movements. Um, so Suzanne Diduk describes groups of older women congregating wearing old garish clothing with bottle top or wild seed necklaces, baseball caps turned backwards, they sing and ululate on the march. A rich song repertoire serves as collective memory of earlier mobilizations, says Diduk. Um, so women are singing to themselves of their earlier triumphs. Women on the way to hold the country enjoy themselves immensely, says Diduk, talking delightedly about abandoning their hungry husbands to come out. The leaders of the activists are comedians of great humor and skill without shame in mocking figures of authority using nakedness 
to their advantage, making rude and lewd comments about malefactors or teasing bystanders. Men are uniformly excluded from mobilizations and quickly disappear. Um, this isn't just a matter of avoiding embarrassment, says Diduk. Their deep unease originates in the ritually dangerous nature of women's actions. Women had, as Helen's talked about, the traditional right to punish behaviors that insult womanhood. Um, offenses against the moral order like incest, um, offenses of beating a, a pregnant woman. They defended community morality. If they targeted someone's home, a compound with litter of wild grasses and excrement, that person could only move through the community once pollution was cleansed um, with a medicinal rite. Now, Feng Qinggong and Tanga stress an urban cross-ethnic base of Takambeng as it moved into the political arena that, that Helen's mentioned in the early 90s, as Cameroon had this political transition. Takambeng arose in Bamenda, the provincial capital of the Northwest grass fields, in 1990 in response to very repressive well, killings by the government, organizing what were known as ghost town activities, economic boycotts, refusal of utility payments. The older mothers condemned inhumane practices of killing their children, illegal arrests and victimization for political reasons. Takambeng was staunch in support of the opposition SDF party, which was led by Fru and Di, which they viewed as defending the suffering of the masses. And as mothers, they couldn't remain indifferent. They had to take part. So in this allegiance, um, Helen's just referred to the association of Takambeng uh, women with the, the Fon, the chiefs of the, the, the sort of petty chieftains and, and kingdoms of Cameroon. Um, but in this allegiance, they moved away from that traditional allegiance to the Fon, but they kept the links to local women in the countryside who very importantly sent them supplies um, is, as a matter of solidarity. So what we're seeing is with roots in the countryside, um, kind of effortlessly, or not effortlessly, with a lot of effort, the winning moving into an urban base. Takambeng actions took the form of chanting, wailing, stripping themselves naked in order to scare off forces of law and order drafted to quell the civil disobedience campaigns and ghost town operations. Passing by shops and businesses in the morning, they ensured everyone shut down and deserted the streets including at one time invading a slaughterhouse which wouldn't shut down. Now, while the, the non-local Francophone soldiers, um, so they brought soldiers from French speaking parts of Cameroon who would not understand or appreciate the Takumbeng symbolism, and therefore they would not respond in the, in the customary ways. But the military who were local to the grass fields knowing the sacrosanct traditions became paralyzed in following orders. One officer came into close contact with a Takambeng member who knew him and had subsequently got to go for ritual cleansing. In the course of confrontations, some overzealous soldiers were in, who were insistent on confronting some of the Takambeng members died under mysterious circumstances. In public demos in Bamenda, women would march in blocks of 30 to maybe hundreds. Um, you can understand why I don't have photographs of this, and I wouldn't even necessarily show, you know, it's not appropriate to show photographs of this, evidently. So women were marching in blocks of 30 to some hundreds, separated three or 400 yards from other marchers. They're separated from younger women or men of any age. As an expression of Takambeng's spiritual power, this separation. Just as in rural contexts, people rapidly move away, stop, turn their backs, or hide in doorways and slip away down side alleys. The women's complete silence on the march with blades of grass gripped between their teeth to mean no talk, action, made onlookers uneasy. Women move naked to reinforce dead country in Bamenda, read a newspaper caption. 
If Takambe marched in town, stories would tell of men becoming ill and even dying because they saw them, implying seeing women naked or undressed. Women walking naked, defecating publicly, wearing medicinal leaves of the bush, coloring faces with ash, are suggestive of profound spiritual and mystical powers, both political and religious. Takambeg women take great care to shield younger women from such actions, moving them a distance away from their naked mothers. In her discussion of the religious aspects of etiquette of Takambeg, Didok argues, it's less that na female nakedness affronts onlookers and more that displaying female genitalia is a powerful act of moral censure embodying widely shared assumptions about mystical power and pollution. It's precisely the essentialist definition of women, their associations with production and reproduction, their guardianship of life in all its forms that allows them to act so powerfully. One 60 year old woman who considered the Takambeng women as kings of the earth, and we can notice that gender. I mean, it's interesting to hear that in English. I don't know how it translates. Kings of the earth, architects of life, by virtue of their procreative capacity said, it's natural, we are life. He or she who does not show respect to the spring of life calls for darkness. Okay, so now um, from that, you know, that, that, that is quite clearly you know, revealing to us um, a whole cosmology of, of ritual practice um, being summoned up by these, uh, these, these uh, deployments and, and deportments, bodily deportments of women, apparently going you know, across all moral bounds. But um, Susan Didock talks about the civility of incivility. These are civic acts. These were civic acts being performed by Takenbed mothers. Um, and yet they're doing this by through what appears to be extraordinary incivility. Um, but as Didok says, there is a, a, a kind of moral acknowledgement or agreement, a collective agreement that what the mothers were doing was, was necessary, was moral, was the right thing to do to create these ghost town activities. And therefore they had all this space of respect, except the difference between the Francophone soldiers who did not accept the sacrosanct cosmology compared to those, the Anglophone local soldiers who, who did. So that is, uh, that is a theme that is especially important uh, when we come to consideration of the Igbo Women's War, um, which I'm going to move to next, um, and I'm going to go back to share screen. I'm just going to ask people, how many people actually uh, here have heard of the Igbo Women's War? How many people? It's like a really small, and you might have just vaguely heard of it without actually quite knowing about it. Um, 1929 in the aftermath of the Wall Street crash. And I'm gonna give a, a basic kind of description, but I want first to say something from um, Ifyama Dume's, uh, with, uh, can I have a little light? Uh, yeah, well, I, I can probably manage the light. That, 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 that'll do fine, thanks. Perfect. Um, about uh, the, the kind of Igbo um, uh, uh, kind of tactics, why it was called, because actually Igbo was, uh, can I get that out of the way? Just get so the slides show better. Um, right. So this is Ogu Umun Wanye the Women's War of 1929, of the aftermath of the Wall Street crash. Um, next week, Paulina von Hellemann's talking about palm oil, the history of palm oil in Nigeria, very fascinating material. And it was the palm oil, in, the palm oil cultivation that crashed as a commodity in the aftermath of Wall Street. Um, that so affected women and caused this enormous movement for several weeks. It was actually about a moon that was challenging um, and um, taking the war to the British authorities, the colonial authorities in Nigeria. Um, and it had been foreshadowed um, early in the, in the 20s, 25, by Nwabiala, the dancing women's movement. But for the British authorities, I and mean, for the British authorities, this 
extraordinary, a movement of women, let's just say how many are we, we're talking about um, this area, oh, I need to go back, this area of the Niger Delta. Um, so that is over 50 odd miles across. This is up sort of 200 miles uh, um, up. We're talking about mainly Igbo and Ibibio um, ethnic groups. And um, it is, um, you know, kind of <laughs> thousands of women mobilized over an area some 6,000 square miles um, containing a population of about 2 million inhabitants. Um, if we're looking at some of the details on this map, women were burning, destroying and damaging the, the hated native courts. Firing refers to where, I believe it refers to where British and colonialists were turning machine guns on naked unarmed women. Some 51 women were killed, a one man they was killed. Um, there was looting and burning of European factories. This was an, an extraordinary uprising. It was, it was massive. And nevertheless, um, the, the British tried to reduce it to, they called it the ABBA riots. There was a few riots, actually. I think they were a little bit more worried by that. ABBA was a, a, a railway town in, in the sort of center of the region and uh, very where the, where the women were all constantly passing through it was they were, they were constantly traveling through that area um so why is it called the war uh, in this tradition well this is because of the Igbo women's um institutionalized form of punishment for offenders which is known as sitting on or making war on a man and this is uh, description from Judith Van Allen. To sit on or make war on a man involved gathering at his compound at a previously agreed upon time, dancing, singing scurrilous songs, detailing the woman's grievance against him, insulting him along the way, calling his manhood into question, banging his hut with pestles used for pounding yams, in extreme cases tearing up his hut, the women would stay at his hut all night and day until he repented and promised to mend his ways. Women's war thus conveys an action by women, also an extension of their traditional method by settling grievances with men. Um, now, what happened with Ogu Umawanye um, was that women took that war against the British colonial authorities in, in no uncertain terms. Um, but if we just look at the, the kind of culture out of which that came with, with the help of Ipiyama Dume, these public tra tra demonstrations formed a very highly effective means of enforcing decisions and judgments of the village women's associations. Um, and their other most feared weapon was a mass walkout and strike, effectively a cooking, childcare and sex strike. Igbo anthropologist Ipiyama Dume described uh, the traditional all-female council for the women of Nobi, with her own home town of origin, headed by Agba Ekwe, the favoured one of the goddess Idemili and her earthly manifestation. Idemili took the form of a python. With her staff of authority, Agba Ekwe ensured male compliance with taboos like a two-year ban on sex for a nursing mother and guarded against sexual harassment. The council she ordered, as she led, ordered mass strikes and demos in the case of violations. When ordered to strike, women refused to perform expected duties and roles, including all domestic sexual and maternal services. They'd leave the town en masse, carrying only suckling babies. If angry enough, they were known to attack any man they met. Um, now I could go into some more details, but I'm gonna try and keep it short here. These ultimate sanctions, or the threat of them, were wielded against offenders by consensus of vill village-based collectives of wives of a lineage. Harsh penalties, ostracism, would be imposed on any woman who broke ranks with the collective. Thus, women's organizations had some coercive power to enforce very high levels of solidarity. Um, and the, the, the root, the sort of nub or the, the, the um, nodes of organizations were the Mikiri or meetings of the women. 
um, who adjudicated on matters that related to the markets, to crops and livestock that were of concern to women. And if men did anything that messed up women's economic activities, um, those rulings had to be observed by men and women would take action if they weren't. They also attended to questions of morality, um, to violent male behavior or disrespect. But there's one really interesting example um, where the women's collective would act in support of any individual maltreated by her husband. But uh, for instance, um, molestation on bush paths, uh, harassment, sexual harassment in general. But this very interesting example is when women leapt to them to each other's defense to protect their right to take lovers. This is from J.S. Harris. Women acted in solidarity that they had this right of sexual freedom. The men, he explains, were extremely angry because their wives were openly having relations with lovers. The men met, they had their own organizations. They met and passed a law to the effect every woman of the village should renounce her lover publicly and present a goat to her husband as token of repentance. The women held secret meetings. And a few mornings later, they went to a neighboring village, leaving all but suckling children behind them. The normal sex drive. The men endured it for a day and a half, and then they <laughs> went to the women and begged their return. The men gave the women one goat and apologized informally and formally. <laughs> So just in the way that um, the Com women drew on their traditional template of sexual resistance as a form of widespread protest against colonial authorities, so this happened in the historic series of uprisings culminating in the Igbo Women's War of 1929. And as I've said, tens of thousands of women mobilized in actions over this 6,000 square miles of palm oil bearing Niger Delta. Um, they applied sitting on a man tactics to the British colonial appointed warrant chiefs and native courts um, and the inglorious incomprehending British response was to turn machine guns onto massed crowds of women who were believing themselves ritually inviolate, as certainly they should be in the cosmology that they're acting within, and many um, tens of you know, dozens of women were slaughtered uh, when they were unarmed protesters. Um, let me just say a little bit, we'll give a bit more of the atmosphere of this. I don't want to go on too long um, and I've got a couple more. I'm going to say a little bit more of, uh, of this because I want to um, yeah, just give some flavor. I mean, when I first came across this labor women's war material, uh, I was just, I, why don't we know about this? We've, it's so many people here in the room who really didn't know about it. And when 30 years ago I began to learn about it, it was like, why, why isn't this clearly known about um, the kind of mayhem and slaughter that, that, that the British Empire was you know, inflicting on um, the resistors in, in Nigeria amongst other places? Um, and it's just terrifying that it is so hidden um, and of course, we know what uh, the, the Tory governments are going to do with that sort of historic knowledge in the future. Um, the causes of the war would really that the collapse of the palm oil was obviously a big, big trigger, trigger, but it was even before that, the restiveness with the dancing women's movement, which was really an anti-Christian movement where women were resisting um, the, the influence of, of Christianization. But also it was the threat of being taxed. They believed rumors about women's um, work and industry being taxed. And for them, this was a, an attack on women as described as fruit bearing trees, an attack on the land itself and women's relationship to the land they described as dying of the land. That, so it's like a, a, an extreme anti-capitalist position that there should be this extraction from, from their profits by this, uh, the occupiers in the, uh, as, uh, as the you know, in control of the state regime. Um, so it's when they were uh, uh, faced with the prospect of being taxed that if we go back to the map, 
um, women of the Oloko region, which is right there in the center up there, um, they reacted immediately to the threat, calling the threat of taxation that they'd heard about, calling a meeting at the market. We women held a large meeting at which we decided to wait until we heard definitely from one person that women were to be taxed, in which case we would make trouble as we didn't mind to be killed for doing so. We went to the houses of all the chiefs and each admitted he'd been counting, doing a census. The warrant chief at Oloko was a very unpopular figure called Okugo, who was hesitant, he was just scared to start a census. He wasn't brave enough. He sent um, an unemployed school teacher in called um, Emerua to start doing this task, who went to one woman's compound, um, a woman called Nwana Nwanyerua, late in November. And they had a big, sharp exchange and started a, a fight. Now, when Wanyarua was threatened with discipline by the warrant chief, and the, who these warrant chiefs were, were, the, were the, the Nigerian kind of collaborators working with the colonial regime to run the native courts. And they were really hated by the women because what the British native courts had done was exclude women from any consultation. The, the British couldn't con conceive of women being you know, so important in, in public life. So this is why the warrant chiefs and the native courts were so detested. Um, and when she, um, Nwani Arua, immediately went to the women's meeting and the women's meeting, you know, they immediately realized the tax threat was real, it was going to happen. So they sent palm leaves as messages immediately to surrounding villages. And then those villages again to further villages. And this rallying signal brought willing women flooding into Oloko to immediate support. So the women sat on Emerua, this teacher who'd been doing the census, and then they besieged Okogu's compound. Attacked by the warrant chief's men, the women at first retreated and then came back with even more force. A deputation was sent to the district officer, that is the British district you know, administrative officer at Bende um, center close by to charge the warrant chief Okugo with assault. The district officer arrived on the scene to a gathering of more than a thousand women. He attempted to assure them they wouldn't be taxed. Um, but by this stage, the women didn't just want to, you know, you know, assurance about tax. They wanted the warrant chief arrested and tried because of his assault. Several days of mass protest achieved that end when the DO charged Okugo and took him back to Bendy on November 29th. So this is now the end of November. The women were still not satisfied. They continued pouring into Bende town. So in his evidence, the district officer described this scene in very distinctively British upper-class terms. The women numbering over 10,000 were shouting and yelling around the office in a frenzy. They demanded his cap of office, which I threw to them, and it met the same fate as a fox's carcass thrown to a pack of hounds. The station between the office and the prison resembled Epsom Downs on Derby Day. <laughs> yeah, this is the language of the, so the victors and occupiers of the, of the um, you know, the, the, the um, revolutionaries. Um, so, but, but this was a victory for the women and the news of the victory of the removal of that hated warrant chief just spread far and wide alongside the tax rumors. And this just, so again, this is how the British authorities were describing it. Women elsewhere struck out blindly against the authorities. Uh, no, it wasn't blindly, it was superbly organized along all these different pathways. Um, who had been responsible for old wrongs and who they believed were finally going to destroy them, failing to have strong leaders. That means they, were, they had complete collectivity rather than strong leaders, governed by emotion and hatred, <laughs> believing that they were safe from harm. Well, if it wasn't for you with the machine guns, yes, they were. <laughs> and the women throughout Oweri and Northern Calabar provinces turned to the business of destroying the warrant chiefs and the native courts. So, you know, they, it wasn't just tax. It wasn't just economic. It was, it, it was an attack on the whole legal administrative system that they started to raise. Um, 
and I could go into even more, but I, I'll just pick up some of the uh, um, some of the, the most of this testimony comes from a, a major inquiry that the British, uh, you know, they were just like, what the hell happened after all this by like, the end of 1929. And there was a major inquiry institute which brought witness and testimony from a huge number of, of women um, and then some you know, recommendations of reform. What also happened was that the British sent in a whole team of women anthropologists performing the sort of handmaiden of colonialism task of anthropology to find out what, 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 how did these women do this? What, what were they doing? And that, so a lot of research got instituted on the Igbo women's um, culture as a result. There were actual instances of attack on white people, though that was a very, you know, that was a, a further step that was not exactly what the women were intending. But what happened on one occasion, so in the railway town of Abba, and that, that's in the middle of the whole area, um, and why it was called the Abba riots by the British, um, so the, the bit that the British labelled was the bit where white people were actually attacked. And it was a car containing a doctor and nurse who were trapped in the middle of a big crowd of women and the driver just swerved away and hit a couple of the women, hurting them, badly injuring them. Um, the crowds then chased the car into the compound of a British factory where the doctor and nurse took refuge. In fury, women looted the compound and later flooded back into ABBA to begin looting at the bank, post office and stores. The incident resulted in a rapid escalation of attacks on white property, mainly factories and shops of various places along the railway. So that, that was a very strategic because of ABBA being on the railway. Um, and all government buildings were burned. Uh, the Nigerian products factory looted by December the 14th. That evening, women danced, sang and drummed around the compound of the supportive, there was a supportive warrant chief, or he thought it was his best interest to be in their support. Um, by the 15th, women were dressed in their war regalia, stripped to the waist, wreathed in wild ferns and palm leaves, their faces daubed with charcoal. Um, I'm actually going to show you something which is a very recent, so this is from an anti rope rape protest of 2015, but the Igbo women wearing almost exactly the same kind of regalia that they would have been then in 1929, okay? Um, with the wreath, the wild ferns and the, the vines coming from the bush, again, this identity. Um, faces door with charcoal, carrying sticks of bamboo and cassava, advancing on the station, which was defended by a small number of soldiers. The officer, Captain James, ordered his men to fire twice, killing some women, failing to halt the crowd, then ordered seven rounds of machine gun fire. Um, 18 women were left dead on that occasion. And, that was, and right on the next day, there were a further 32 women killed in appalling car, carnage at Apobo, um, a point blank range by 30 soldiers firing two volleys. So this bloodshed actually occurred mainly among the Ibibio women, Calabar province, who had an extraordinary, um, they bore the brunt of bloodshed in that 1929 uh, uprising, unsurpassed in bravery. And they were organized through um, ritual societies, secret societies called Ebere, which um, meant women of the land. And it's this association, this is the above, but it would be the similarity of this association with the women and the vegetation is the symbolism of that. Um, their symbolic use of wild ferns was an identification of women with the wild, the reproductive powers of nature, women's reproductive and productive powers, which, they've, which they feared losing because of the, uh, the threat of taxation, the occupate, that the land had been taken from them it was like losing their life force. A ritualized expression of inviolability used especially by Abibio women was wearing tails of grass, declaring they were vultures. And this is testimony from those inquiries by an Abibio woman, Emena Opopo, who witnessed British slaughter at Utu Etimekpo, and she gave this evidence. I was surprised to see the soldiers fire as we were women, we call ourselves vultures. 
as we did not think soldiers would fire at us. Vultures go to market and eat food there and nobody molests them. Nobody will kill a vulture, even in the market, even if it kills fowls. We only firing sticks at them if they take our chop. And so we thought soldiers will not harm us, no matter what we may do. Men are never called vultures. Um, so those vultures who are like the messengers to the ancestors in many ways, and they were also um, known to be representative in men's war warrior ritual societies. So women's claiming of being vultures was in some way a calling of making themselves out as, as warriors as well, as well as as messengers to the ancestors. Okay, I better, better move on to my, my last section. Um, I'm sorry to take so long and it's partly because we've had, we've had Helen with us, but I, I think that was really important to, to hear from her. Um, just a quick, a quick last section to mention um, two of three, three African women have won the Nobel Peace Prize, and two of them have been involved in some way with naked protest. Um, uh, one's the late Professor Wangari Matai of the Green Belt Movement, who you may well have heard of. Um, I'm going to just skip forward, actually, I'm going to, so that's Wangari Matai. Um, and the other is Lema Gbawi. And both were involved in very famous episodes of women's collective naked protest. Maui was laureate in 2011, and she was a key organizer of cross-faith, cross-ethnic women's mass protests, which included sex strike actually as, as a kind of tech, tactic um, against uh, the second Liberian civil war from 1999 to 2003. The protests of women of Liberia, Mass Action for Peace, um, WOMAP, were continuing right through June and July in 2003 outside peace negotiations being held in, in the most luxury hotel of Accra, Ghana, um, as a neighboring uh, country hosting the negotiations. And the delegates to that peace conference were getting accustomed to the finest hotel at international expense, so these warlords who were junketing uh, with cocktails around the swimming pool had absolutely no motivation for breaking the stalemate in the negotiations. And meanwhile, back in Liberia, women and children being killed, men too, um, and that war threatening to spill over into neighbors, Guinea, Sierra Leone as well. Um, so the Walmart women were becoming just utterly frustrated. They blockaded the so-called negotiators into the main meeting hall. As the warlords realized that they were obstructed from their lunch, Gbawi was threatened with arrest for obstructing justice. I was so angry, she says, I was out of my mind. I will make it very easy for you to arrest me. I'm going to strip naked. I took off my hair tie. Beside me, Sugars rose to her feet and began to do the same. I pulled off my lapper, exposing the tights I wore underneath. No, no, shouted the husband of one of our protesters, a Liberian banker who'd come to the talk that day. I didn't have a plan when I started taking off my clothes. My thoughts were jumbled. Okay, you think you'll humiliate me with an arrest? Watch me humiliate myself more than you could have dreamed. I was beside myself, desperate. Every institution I'd been taught was there to protect the people had proved evil and corrupt. Mm -hmm. Everything I valued collapsed. These negotiations had been my last hope, but they were crashing too. But in threatening to strip, I'd summoned up a traditional power in Africa. It's a terrible curse to see a married or elderly woman deliberately bear herself. If a mother's really, really upset with a child, she might take out her breast and slap it and he's cursed. For this group of men to see a woman naked would be almost like a death sentence. Men are born through women's vaginas. And it's as if by exposing ourselves, we say we now take back the life we gave you. Fear passed through the hall. The peace women's determination shamed the men into backing down and getting serious uh, with the negotiations. Now, in this case, the naked protest proved so successful that just the threat of it was achieving the effect. 
for Wangari Maathai, um, the first African woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, she didn't herself strip in protest, but she was very strongly present as a supporter of the group of mamas who occupied this place called Freedom Corner in Uhuru Freedom Park in Nairobi, February and March of 1992. Those mamas had been there for some months protesting arbitrary detention of their sons as political prisoners, challenging President Daniel Arap Moy's ruling Kanu government. These were rural elderly Gikuyu women, but they were strategically politically skillful, deploying their own status and roles and imagery associated with mothers and women. Um, the uh, Kenyan academic Wambui Mwangi explains, in many African communities, there's no stronger curse or taboo about, upon men than seeing the mothers naked. There is no stronger way for women acting together to register political dissent. Deployed in this way, women's bodies have the power to make something public, to create a public around this action. Now, when Moy's government sent in armed police to evict the mothers, they stripped naked in defiant protest. In the police onslaught, Matai herself was beaten unconscious and hospitalized. When Matai first arrived a few days earlier, she inspired the Kikuyu mothers who'd been for some time at a nearby cathedral to move to a camp at this Freedom Park. Um, and in that park to start a hunger strike um, with her on February 28th, right at the end of February. The international media attention attracted by Matai and other opposition leaders provoked Moy's swift attack. And by March the 3rd, the police were ordered to clear the area completely. So the journalist reporting, Mukalo Kwayera, recounts, the police swung into action they first threw tear gas at the women. Then as they scampered helter-skelter amid the smoke of the gas, the police landed on them with rungus, batons, whips, and gun batons, bludgeoning elderly mothers senseless. In a twinkling, continues Quayero, um, the striking elderly women stripped naked, most of them you know, 60, 70 years old. The harmless mothers did so as a last resort of defense and a curse to the autocratic administration. And that's a photograph of this. You know, this would be a very traumatic moment um, that's, that's still there. I'm not gonna leave that photo there for, for very long, but just to, just to further continue the description. Quayero found one of the tooled up policemen, an old school friend of his, sobbing after running away from the scene. He couldn't talk to me. He just stared at me and continued sobbing. What happened in the melee shocked and shook him and his colleagues. The elderly women with no other weapon to defend themselves had a show of defiance actually stripped naked in front of them, forcing the most youthful policemen to retreat with their heads down. His old friend had realized with disgust how Matai was deliberately violently targeted. Then the stripping of the women had shattered him completely with he too fearing the women's curse would ensnare him as well. So Alex Tibbetts reported through three of the elderly mothers, in fact, stripped in response to the police brutality. And many Kenyans believed that by stripping, the mothers put a curse not on the individual policemen, but on the Moy regime, an authoritarian government, which had made little progress in its promise to restore civil liberties. Some said the curse was on the entire nation. The next day, riots broke out across Nairobi as people became outraged by the treatment of the women on hunger strike. The general public were in strong support. Thousands of sympathizers came to visit um, with the women who had gone back to the cathedral as their, their kind of fortress. Women's organizations met the day after the day the women bared all to plan denouncing the beatings in solidarity. On the 2nd of April, some three months later, the day of a national strike organized by the main opposition parties, the mamas were barricaded into the cathedral, surrounded by a highly intimidating police presence. Now, what was interesting was that there were men among the guards who were taking protection to, for, for the women, those elder mothers, but they were dressed as women 
believing they were safer from aggression and violence as an all female gathering. So we see, we see something very interesting happen with gender that women may be used, may be using masculine clothing and then men who are part of their you know, coalition using feminine clothing. It took a few months with a blaze of international publicity covering this brutality uh, that within which several of the pro political prisoners were actually released. And some 20 years later, Matai's state funeral was held at Freedom Corner. Tibbetts relates the Mama's strategy to historic forms of protest of um, Gekuyu, notably known as Guturamire Nganya, cursing a person by stripping. This could be performed by a very large group of women who lined up their backs towards an offender, removed their undergarments, bent forward, lifted their skirts in unison. In this manner, um, they indicate they will have no further social dealings with the people of the area concerned, or that they do not recognize the authority of the man whom they part thus deliberately insulted. And this form of moral resistance is a power for older women, known or supposed to be mothers, exposure of genitals in this way symbolized mother's secrets. Okay, I want to have a very quick final, and I'm sorry to take so long, very quick final um, sum up on uh, some of this. And just to put in a last aspect of kind of evolutionary perspective to come back to where I'm most normally uh, kind of stand, standing. There are, uh, there is a whole um, contingent of very often men, not always men, evolutionary anthropologists who make an argument that, you know, women didn't have a lot to do in human evolution because they couldn't make large alliances. They couldn't make significant coalitions that could go across um, large distances, across landscapes, um, that they were, women were always too competitive anyway and couldn't have solidarity. Um, these are men who only perceive the alliances of men and coalitions of men. And I hope that you agree with me that this has been completely busted. Um, the sort of people that I'm talking about are people like Richard Wrangham, for instance, author of a, a notable book called The Goodness Paradox. And Richard Wrangham argues that morality came out of um, men in alliance doing execution squads, squads against obnoxious men and kind of killing off um, men who are, you know, just very badly alpha male dominant obnoxious characters. But it's quite clear from this material that, that women in the deploying these strategies are quite capable of killing men um, in ways that don't require guns and weapons. Most especially if they're acting in a cosmology with which the men themselves are also engaged, because we've got the difference where the British, completely uncomprehending, are using their machine guns. The, in the Nairobi case, the, you know, the corrupt government of, uh, of Arab Moy was not uncomprehending. They, everybody in Nairobi believed there had been a curse put on the nation because he acted in the way he had. So what we're looking at is, I would argue that this is a kind of foundation of a, a moral bedrock. That's it, it's a kind of a strategy or a matrix from which the the whole of, of, of morality itself emerged in some sense in, in an evolutionary perspective. Um, women persistently in these patterns seem to be going beyond all moral bounds, behaving in a way, you know, defecating publicly, total nakedness. And yet the shame is on those who target, who are targeted. And there is a moral agreement, a collective understanding that what's occurred is an appalling act of wrongdoing. So that women are establishing a, a whole moral framework. Of, um, Roy Rappaport has talked about ritual itself as being meta-performative, the, the structure which the framework which establishes the possibility of performatives. Here we've got the mothers in these actions kind of establishing the possibility of morality itself. It's like they are in this, this laying down this geological moral bedrock. Um, but they're doing it in a very dynamic way with this movement, this body's in motion. 
Now, I wanted to come back. I mean, the typical form here is, if we can kind of summarize, is an interface of women's collective ritualized bodily deportment, which summons spiritual forces. And it's that integration. Um, and which has is known within the cosmologies as morally sacrosanct, and and it's it's a complete, um, you know, the, an extreme of of um, moral injustice that's that's occurred. I want to come back to. Oh God, I've gone to the wrong place. I'm sorry. That's where I want. I want to come back to hunter gatherers and just look very quickly at an instance, uh, uh, a occasion when we do find nakedness in hunter-gatherer ritual and just compare aspects with, the, with what we've been hearing about the kind of ritualized nakedness um, in the, the women's resistance of the non-hunter-gatherer movements, very urban political movements, some of them. So this is a rock, well, my favorite rock art painting, a photograph that wasn't taken by Ian Watts, was actually taken by Anne Solomon. And it's from a rock art painting from the Drakensberg in Southern Africa, um, which would have been painted probably many centuries ago by mountain bushmen of that area. And it's believed to depict the first ri menarche ritual, the first menstruation ritual of the girl who's inside a hut, that little, ring around there and this is the girl lying in the, under a cloak inside the hut and around her are dancing many women. Now in the descriptions we have from Kalahari, you can see probably if you're there, in the descriptions we have from the Kalahari, women become naked on these occasions and this is one of the only occasions when um, Kalahari women would, are known to become naked. Um, and in doing so, they're doing two things. They are well, they're identifying with people of the early race um, no, who existed in what was called first creation, time before time, when nothing was fixed and everything was changing, moving, moving. Um, and people of the early race, had, uh, they had Eland heads, people of the Eland heads. So they're identifying with the girl as Elands and they are dancing in mating postures of elands. So, um, and in doing so, they are separating out the ring of the women with the men on the margins and the hunting weapons of the men. And men, the belief is the men cannot look, they cannot see the girl who is inside the hut. It's absolute, you've got to look away, um, got to remove their weapons from that space. So we have a number of quite strikingly similar. This is not a protest. This is a celebration of great joy of the girl's fertility, of the, girl, of, of the power of the girl in her menstruation, the power to summon the great Eland antelope and so on. This is not a protest, but we're seeing so many of the same ingredients as we're seeing in those um, spiritual, bodily and spiritual movements of the, the other African communities. Nakedness, the entry into the domain of the ancestors, the domain of the, the spirits of the former spirits. Movement of men out of the space, they've got to respect that aversion of male gaze and a kind of moral configuration of the entire society. The, the, the moral basis of the society was, it was like this was the occasion when it, it was going to be tested, that the moral basis had to, the, the ritual must be observed to maintain that, that, that moral structure. Um, so I, I'll just leave it at that. We've gone on far too long here, but leaving it at that, um, we can see where there could be, you know, this is, you can't jump easily from this hunter-gatherer ritual to the types of rituals that are being performed by women in those urban and farming and rural communities. Uh, but there are some of the same ingredients in establishing the, the whole moral basis of the societies and communities concerned. Hey. Yeah, there. Sorry to go on so long. Helen, are you still there? Still on your break. Yeah.
Yes, I am, but I'm about to go back into uh, work. Uh, have a good day. Thank you so much for. Oh, thank you. This is amazing. Yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for being and able I, to join in that. And I, I might not be able to join in on the discussion, but I have a comment in the chat, which hopefully when I watch the recording later, right. I get to hear your perspective on that. Wonderful. Um, yeah, we'll talk about it. You've got to go. You you've got to go. Um, All right. I'm going to talk more about the prospect of doing a, a project on this Cameroon as well. Lovely. Lovely. Cool. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye Helen. Thank Bye, you Helen. very much. Wonderful. I'm going to check out what, um, what Helen was talking about. So, yeah, we're open to questions, really. Um, uh, questions from this audience, and then I'll ask questions from uh, the uh, the Zoom audience. So, Chris, Chris. Yeah, just briefly, could you possibly repeat that? Part of the question, Shirley Oh, Shirley Ardner. Um, uh, sexual insult and female militancy. Um, possibly Chris can write on the board. And uh, if you have our human, I mean, it's easy to find as a PDF online, you'll find it. Sexual insult and Female Militancy is one of her most famous articles. Um, we published in the book, the edited volume Human Origins, because we wanted to bring it up against um, kind of some of the discussions of female strategies and human origins. Well, yeah, I'll have to repeat the question. You're asking, in which cultures can we find the, the, the extreme fears to the point that men are afraid for their lives if they see the naked mothers? Um, whereas it seems like there's this, this division between Anglophone, British occupied Cameroon and the French occupied part um, that it did, you know, that, that one set of, of the soldiers wasn't afraid and the other set was very afraid. It seems to associate to their being local and being part of the the ritualized you know, performances. And Helen referred to the Fonds, the chiefs, the, the Fondums were kind of ritual kings or chiefs who were responsible for all kinds of sacred and ritual practice like masquerade. Um, it's a question that I would like to work with Helen to try to answer because I don't think anyone's really looked at, although I think there may be many more sources from Cameroon and African scholars than, than we've been know, found out in, in, in British. So it's a really good question, um, but I won't be able to tell you in much detail about it at this stage. Um, yeah. And Helen herself was talking about, I was talking about um, Liberia, and Helen's just commented about Le Lemagbawi's protests and its effectiveness. So the Liberian women's protests in the area that Lema Gabawi was working across many ethnic groups, what does tend to unite women of those ethnic groups. Now, what is, is um, an initiation society, a women's secret society known as Sande, or sometimes Gondu. Um, and having this ritual basis of secret societies gives an enormous amount of shared collective interest, um, discipline, and a very tight discipline. I mean, it's like party discipline, it's very tight. Um, so I would agree absolutely with Helen's comment there that that was underlying the background of, the, of particularly when it was about uh, Liberian rural women's involvement, more so than the, the perhaps women in, in Monrovia um, in the capital. Uh, but th that would be, so it's about the, the kind of the ritual links that women have on the land, how do they transfer into very highly urban contexts? And what are the, those pathways? That, that's one of the mysteries, particularly in the case of Takambe. How is that, how is that operative? It's quite interesting, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, any, uh, Chris, did you want to say? I'm just wondering, has anyone, has anyone partly answering or addressing Kevin's question? Um, I didn't know that during the Yidan Bull Dance or any of those first menstruation rituals, it was to be looked at by the girls as a penny to stone or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, 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 but I'm wondering, does anyone link that to the 
hugely widespread, uh, notion of the evil eye. Uh, it seems to me to be kind of example. If, if this evil eye looks at you, uh, then you're you're kind of dead. And so across Turkey and the upper parts of the world, yeah. you have these special yeah. eyes to sort of yes push the, push the, the gaze back the other way. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone's done anything. Like I'm just happy. thinking about that that. And June, you gave a beautiful present of, of to Chris of the blue, um, yeah. you know, that, that protect, yes, you do, you still got it, you still got it. Um, the blue, Samos, was it when you came back from Samos? Well, so, well, to protect I, him from the evil eye, what a so, lovely I gift. It wasn't the evil eye, it was the protection. No, it's the protection. The and the protection yeah, against what I'll give you normally. <laughs> the the protection, yeah, you're doing you you're really That's great at that. that. You're great at that. <laughs> the protection is very blue. That that yeah, yeah, often that you. Mediterranean. Well, I think um, it's actually great, not perfect. It's it's all over. It's, all over. Mediterranean. it's international, no borders. Um, and it's blue and it's got the shape. It's a bullseye, isn't it? It looks like a bullseye with the eye there. But what I'm suggesting is that, well, it, it's, it's a kind of structural opposition leap to red, cunt, genitalia, looks at you and, and kind of turn that the other way around. Um, there probably are connections, but it would take an enormous project. That's a fantastic project for somebody to get involved with and look at. Yeah, anybody who, who who's interested in that um, might think about. I mean, we know that the symbolism, our, a friend who studied all the kilims from across um, you know, Turkey and Anatolia and nearly all the motifs in here in this carpet are fundamentally like women's spread leg genitalia in their origins. Yeah. And these are the it's same kind of. Uh, now, if you see the real studies on this, John uh, it isn't uh, that. Well, he published the study. Um, but if you see the real studies on this, this goes back to the designs in Chattel Hayuk and so on. Um, that basically, although, these are woven by, these are women's art. They're woven by women. And they're weaving women's power into the carpets. They kind of formalize sheen energies. Yeah. yeah. Um, very iconic type of sheen energies. Yeah, that, that's kind of what it is. Um, but yeah, you don't have to believe us, June. They also think that there's a variation of 64 different um, sheen energies in the Roll story. And um, Zoom people, are there any questions that you'd like to put out? Um, we've got some lovely ones in the chat. Um, I'm just going to take some from Zoom and then come back to you, June, OK? Um, uh, da, 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 da. Mark, do you want to say something, Mark? Oh, about mosquito women. Um, well, it's just um, reminded me somehow of um, some of the forms of um, ritual um, humiliation of young men and so on, not just in Mesquite, but um, in lowland South and Central American um, uh, society or cultures, generally speaking, where in certain ritual contexts that uh, um, older women as classificatory uh, mothers-in-law confront and shame their classificatory sons-in-law through, you know, um, abandoning respect and avoidance, which is the uh, normative ways to behave towards classificatory sons-in-law in certain kind of contexts. So I thought that's something that might be interesting to look at for compar more further comparative material, although, you know, perhaps less dramatic than some of the um, uh, ethnography you've been presenting us here, but it's might find something illuminating in there. Uh, I think you you must be right about that. That that um, classificatory mothers-in-law using their you know these tactics with sons-in-law of shaming sons-in-law would be yeah something really interesting. Um, there was a very nice contribution. I'll come back to you, June. That um, is Svetlana. I wonder if you wanted to say something. You said you study. Uh, Dukobo, the Russian sect, uh, some of whom resettled in Canada and formed a Sons of Freedom movement famous for nude parades as a means of resistance to Canadian authorities. 
um, who forced their children to go to school. They also undressed in other sacred solemn occasions, celebrating, celebrating uh, greeting a guest, uh, both men and women. And is it the same threatening vulnerability, uh, action and demonstration of power? Is nakedness itself a sort of universal language of the oppressed? Um, it's, quite, it's quite possible that that could be. Um, but, I, but I'm also in these, uh, in these uh, ethnographies taking, you know, some of these women are not necessarily, they're, they're being very powerful, uh, not just, um, they are resisting oppression, but sometimes they, they, they are <laughs> establishing their power in a, in a very powerful way. And they are also gaining, um, oh, we've got, we've got uh, the, the baby here, Te Teddy here, is a lovely Teo here. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and they're um, gaining agreement from the wider society, even when they're doing these quite, uh, apparently it, uncivil acts as well. Um, June, you want a question? I was just going to say that um, particular, there are some recent examples from the British Isles. It's not, not, not your lot going down right here, it's not just that, but um, what we call the scourge process right. um, of the IRA, Right. Past. It's not necessarily nudity, but usually things that are so taboo, as in yeah. shit, yeah. taboo, right? Sure. Um, and obviously the thing that happened at Greenham, which the police made a big deal of, that, that the women were so disgustingly filthy, um, and on one occasion that they stripped naked and covered themselves in shit. And, uh, and I just see that. Wow, happen. okay. I see that to happen. It was also but, used as police right. propaganda, but it was sure. effective yeah. in, as a protest because the police were anywhere near these women. Right, yes. Um, and they couldn't arrest them. Yeah. Um, I think it was probably agreed with not more than about half a dozen. Wow. Um, but they really did strip naked and they well probably done. covered themselves in most of them not shit. But yeah, but think, who could tell the difference? I don't Fantastic. Think they yeah. Really cared because they were uh -huh. fairly sort of like brilliant um, angry. Yep. Amazing, amazing example. And they definitely do, do you know if there's any documentary evidence of that or is it just like stories and if I asked that, I could mm. probably find one of the women that did it, wow. or at least eyewitnesses. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. It would be worth getting but some testimony. There must be some testimony somewhere in, in all the and documentation. It's also yeah. possible that, um, yeah. that perhaps they knew about this kind of thing. You know, there might have been somebody yeah. that. Absolutely. I, I think just, it, might just yeah. have, it might just have been what they thought of on the spur of the moment. Yeah. Perhaps it would be. It would be really interesting to know what, how that I'm sure happened. It was a sacred thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, What's our time, Chris? How are we doing? Do we, we have it? Five yeah, minutes. five minutes or so. But we got any further, either from Zoom or um, we've got a few more questions. Um, I see the people who've got their hands up. They have. Yeah, where are they? You mean on Zoom or? or? Yeah, you can see everybody who's got their, they have got their hands up. Um, I haven't got anybody raising hands. Zoom people, if you want to um, chip in with something, please do. Um, and anybody from the class, I mean, we can wind up shortly. My, my question would be very simple. Do you think it would work in Britain? Yeah. <laughs> well, we had the example with XR doing a it seriously. Um, well, I think, what does it mean? Does it work? I mean, on the occasion, of Women's Day, they did a very, they had some fantastic, beautiful pictures, photos. Um, I think they were taking a step towards establishing a cosmology, which they're starting from scratch. You know, how do we change the, send back the male gaze of, the, and that was very young women. It wasn't mothers and grandmothers. Um, how do we send that male gaze back? So I think that was very, a really brave performance. 
But I mean, my experiences have been a few experiences with, with naked protests on occasion. Um, and it's not, it's not an easy thing to do in the culture we have with, uh, with the, you know, such, such a intense male gaze and expectation of what a female body naked. What is, I mean, the picture that I didn't show of that march with the older Yoruba women at the head, and they're, they're all mothers, very dressed down to the waist. Um, it's a kind of multiplier, multiplier effect that the older the woman, the more the women, the more naked, the more power is what it is. Um, and we've had examples like Femen, who were very kind of misguided, but incredibly brave young women. Um, and then there's XR young, younger women, the Argentinian women, and, the, and there's in Chile and Mexico as well, they, they've had examples. Um, but uh, but it, you need to have that cosmology to, to draw off. Mm. I don't know if you do have to have something that is, is sort of like, uh, for most people it's skin, isn't it? So it's like a Wrong sex, wrong species. Or, blurred, species, or yeah. blurred, mm -hmm. to yeah. make it other. It's not yeah. attainable and it's not attractive. Yeah, but, I think that's a very good point. Yeah, yeah. so you don't have to have yeah. a very complicated system. No, I'm it. not saying it's yeah. got to be complicated. It's not got to be complicated. It's a bodily act, a, pant a bodily performance, bodily deportment by the women. And as you say, they're taking all kinds of materials to smear the face, to um, de defecate, to, can be anything. You're right. It's about, you know, ultimately what we call wrong sex, wrong species. So, you know, it's wrong. It's not, it's, it's what? Dis disorientation. So it's dis disorienting a male gaze. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not being available at all. I'm not saying it has to be a complex cosmology, but we can see that if the if the attack, if the oppressors or the 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 violent you know, the, the side that's being violent does not engage with the general system of belief, that disaster can ensue. It's very, you know, it depends. Well, for example, it's quite difficult for armed police officers to attack naked young women. If yeah. there's an in between ground where they can molest them, they might do that. Yeah. But it's very difficult for them to psychologically for them to physically attack. Naked young women. Yeah. The case with old women is probably different. It's a different game. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a, it's a very interesting practical thought. Do you, do you want to say oh, something? No, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, Lieta. Right. Um, okay. We'll, we'll ask Lieta and then come to you. And yeah. Thank you. Hi, I apologize for the mess in my living room. I'm having my kitchen done. So um, I, I'm just kind of something that really, really kind of stuck in my head. Uh, my partner and I are very, very interested in um, church architecture and church sculpture. And, and I'm thinking immediately of a, of a European uh, sort of uh, um, parallel with the Sheen and the Gigs. I don't know if anybody's familiar with them. They are carvings, especially in earlier medieval churches, um, you know, Romanesque of uh, a woman, which is very, very clearly older and it's carved as a gargoyle type thing. Uh, and uh, outside of the church normally, and it is um, offering uh, up, well, not offering up, it's, it's quite a, a scary figure, uh, um, you know, with exposed genitalia. Actually, she normally holds the genitalia open and uh, and it is you know and I, I just found that you know it, it immediately an, an interesting parallel that obviously has been uh, appropriated by Christianity. I have still not quite uh, you know understanding in, in what way really because it really subverses everything that Christianity is trying to impose. But it's obviously lingering from earlier times and as a compromise with with earlier sort of more 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 pagan more earth 
uh, related, you know, but it's obviously coming from, a, a, to me in my head at the moment, in, in, from some similar cosmology. Yes, no, yeah. no, I'd absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I knew from, I know if my, my mother was Finnish and I know that in Finnish peasant um, law, a uh, woman's lifting the skirt, as, uh, lifting the skirt and cursing is, is a very powerful idea. And I'm sure it's very widespread indeed. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's definitely true. And we had a question here as well. No, I it's okay. Oh, okay. No, not. Okay, you, you're allowed. Um, okay, yeah, not, not physical, but I was just thinking about the other work with eyes. Uh, I think that an example to give that I think is. Sorry, could. Conservative settings and kind of traditional settings. Yeah. And, and maybe here in Britain, it seems a kind of radical idea of like. Yeah. Um, suddenly, uh, yeah, it, it is okay. that kind of thing with these African rural women going into the urban context. I mean, they're leading general strikes in urban contexts. It's, it's really pretty. It's, the intersection of, of kind of women's solidarity with class solidarity is just extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, yeah. Um, I think we're nearly, unless anybody's bursting for more questions, I'm sorry I didn't leave enough time for questions, but there's obviously a lot to discuss, um, and thanks for those, yeah, I, I think you, you made some very good points there, June, um, and Lieta, um, and Mark, um, but yeah, I think that's um, probably time to wind up, isn't it? Thank you, so, yeah, thank, well, thank you for listening. Thank you. And thank you very much to everybody on the Zoom um, for your participation. And I'm going to say goodbye to you. Uh, Leoncia will, will be in touch for the, the recording. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye to everybody. Thank you. Um, so next week, so I didn't tell the Zoom people, but next week oh, we're going to hear more from West Africa because uh, Paulina von Hellemann is going to talk about her study on um, palm oil and its history, which is really very, um, a, 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 a very it's kind of the secret of, of a lot of what happened in the history of West Africa in many ways. Um, so that should be a very, very interesting. And she is a senior lecturer at Goldsmiths University, has been doing a lot in research of, of kind of sustainability of palm oil and, and, um, uh, and, and so forth as well. Um, so, uh, should be very interesting. If anyone wants to come to, if anyone uh, wants to risk COVID further and come to the pub, well, uh, <laughs> go on then. We're going to what's it called? Get, get coffee house. It's called. It's the Summerstown Coffee House. Somebody, 